what is project-based learning and how does it apply to the work we're doing in education? I had the opportunity to talk with Ross Cooper and Aaron Murphy, and honestly, they're experts in this area. And I was really fascinated to see how they connected some really kind of forward thinking strategies to traditional strategies and how they actually all mesh in here. This isn't something that you do that's just another thing, but it's really kind of a way of thinking in the work that we can do every day in our classrooms. And so if you want to learn about project-based learning, this is an amazing podcast, not only about how do you implement it, but actually how do you get people to embrace it uh, in your organization as well. But just as an aside, uh, we actually do a little contest and you can get a signed copy of their new book, Project-Based Learning, and you can actually see it right here. And it's, uh, you can get a signed copy from Ross and Aaron, but you actually have to find the keyword. There's a keyword in here and you have to write it in the comments on YouTube. So if you're listening to this on Spotify, iTunes, uh, or someone else, somewhere else, just go to YouTube to the, the video link. You can write the comment and you can actually win a signed copy of the book. So glad you could be here. I hope you enjoy this episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm really pumped to actually have uh, Ross Cooper, who I affectionately call Koopa Loop. And I just started that today before the podcast. But I've known Ross for a very long time and very honored to also connect with Aaron Murphy. And they have written this new book called, and it's like, it's, do you want to know what it's about? It's about project-based learning because that's what it's called. And so it's right here. And so these two uh, authors, educators, uh, live and breathe this stuff. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to like read their work before. I, honestly, and I, I'm not going to lie to anybody. I haven't read this book because I just got it. But I, I read your book prior. Uh, but but you, you told everybody this, this is the one. This is like the project-based learning book. So um, you're going to see the link in the description down below, but I am like really excited to have both of you. And before we got on the podcast, we were actually, you know, playing with noises. So thanks for being on the podcast. <laughs> Is that okay? Can I do that? That's awesome. You can Are do you whatever sure? you want. All right. Okay. Well, you know, every joke, <laughs> boom. So there you go. So, Hey, it's right and Aaron like Ross uh I, like I've known you for a while Aaron it's really great to meet you and I I love the work that you're doing and like how you work with Ross I don't know but <laughs> I'm just I told kidding. you that'll be my next book yeah, <laughs> yeah right how to work and I, Ross. yeah how to deal with difficult people you know working with Ross oh. Cooper no both both <laughs> wonderful people and just uh uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. So um, usually how I start the podcast and I, and, you know, I, I, don't, this, I think the first time I've actually had two guests that uh, at the same time. So Aaron, if you could actually uh, just introduce yourself, tell us about your little bit about educational journey. And I know that you said you're actually just about finishing uh, your doctoral program. Is that correct? Yes. Right. Very close. Two, like two months can, away. Can I call you like, can I like, what's like, can I call you doctor? Like, can I call you almost Dr. Aaron Murphy? Like, uh, just like, yeah, just say I almost very quick. I'm, I think it's doctoral candidate. Oh, okay. I think those I'll do are the that. words. Doctoral okay. candidate Murphy. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, you know, congratulations on that. Um, but tell us a little bit about your, your educational journey. Sure. I, um, I have been teaching now for... Uh, I guess it's 12 years, uh, and I have teaching experience in kindergarten, third, fifth grade. I spent a few years as a tech integration specialist or a tech coach. Uh, I spent five years as a middle school assistant principal. Um, so, you know, shout out to all my middle school friends. That is a special time in a child's life. <laughs> just hold on. To be. Just hold on. Because you said the word. <laughs> That, if you say right. shout out, that's happening. It there might it take is. me a little bit so to that, get there. That goes out to the middle school friends. <laughs> Darn it. Sorry. I set myself up. Sorry. Um, and now I am the supervisor of curriculum in a K-12 district in right outside Allentown, Pennsylvania. Oh, that, that's awesome. And, and so um, can I just ask you before Ross introduced himself, how did you connect with, like Ross was in Pennsylvania, like, how did you two connect on both of your books? Like, how did that happen? 
So we were in the same district for uh, a, f- a, a few years mm-hmm. and then ended up teaching in the same building when the building opened. So Ross taught fourth grade. I taught fifth grade. When I'm, you know, I like to say that I had to fix all the mistakes he made when I got those kids. But no, it was actually really nice because that's, I think, <laughs> actually how we ended up collaborating was because we both had similar philosophies regarding teaching. So when I would get kids that had Ross, they would sort of already have some of that thinking of regarding like how to inquire right. and how to be curious. So that's it, where we, that's where our collaboration came from. And I think, I think that's like such a, like a valuable thing, right? Like, cause I think we, like I, I've had a lot of conversations with schools, you know, my work as an administrator about like building on the experiences, not just like the curriculum, right? So like the example that I use all the time is that we would do digital portfolios and you have uh, a school, like a, a kid do it in grade four and have like really rich experiences. And then the grade five teacher's like, eh, right? And not do it. And then what happened? And then grade six, they do it. And it's like, oh, like what happened in grade five? You just didn't do that anymore. And I think part of it is not like saying uh, like, hey, we're dismissing Aaron's personality and raw, and we're just going to make that every experience the same, but saying like, there's some, you know, uh, built in there. So that's, that's, that's really awesome. And so, um, and I, I know Ross, as much as I joke around, uh, with him has some really amazing educational philosophy. So I'm sure, um, as, as hard as he is to deal with, right, Aaron, that, you know, yeah. it's beneficial. So Ross, can you just talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm right now, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to do it. I had to do it. I don't, I don't even know what sound effect. That was just crickets. Uh, it's a Simpsons, I, I Simpsons got, thing. I got nothing to say. No, I'm, I'm, I'm Ross. I love you, brother. Sorry, man. So I love you too. So yeah, um, yeah right now I'm, I'm an uh, administrator and assistant principal in uh, Chappaqua Central mm-hmm. School District in Westchester, and uh, you. Uh, we had the privilege of hosting you for I think it was beginning of last year mm-hmm. for about a day. You came to our district. You did your keynote and it was awesome. And um, it was great. It was tremendously well received. It was, it was a great day with you. And um, before that, actually, the first time I heard you speak was um, Edscape many years ago, then right. also in Hershey. Right. In New um, Jersey, right? Eric Chanagher. Yeah. yeah. And then, um, so I've been everything from a K through 12 curriculum supervisor, um, elementary, uh, elementary principal, elementary school principal. Um, I've been an assistant principal, fourth grade teacher, third grade teacher for a little bit. I've done some special ed. So a little bit of everything across Pennsylvania, um, New Jersey for a couple of years, and now hopefully staying in New York. You know, I love what I do here. Yeah. I love the people. Re- really great school. Really great school. Love the people here. It's all about the people in the, in Westchester. Yeah, and actually, I, I met um, a couple of your teachers, and they're just awesome. And they are uh they they still I don't know if you know they'll send me messages about my kids and things like that and just like had a really good time uh connecting you know in is it Chappaqua am I saying it right Chappaqua yeah it took yeah. me a while to get it through Chappaqua yeah, yeah. It, just just a really wonderful group and you know a lot of forward-thinking educators in that space uh doing some really incredible things one of the things I want to ask you about because I know a lot of people that connect um, with me and maybe listen to my podcast, I know that they have like an interest in, in writing and we'll get to the project-based learning stuff. Cause I, I really kind of want to, to talk to you about that because I know a lot of people have questions, especially, you know, in virtual hybrid, that kind of thing about project-based learning and like, you know, the value of it. But I want to ask you both about the idea of like writing a book and writing it with someone else, right? Like I had a really good experience. I wrote with Katie Novak and we are both very, I don't want to say prolific because that sounds arrogant, but I don't know that, like, we're very quick. Like, like we, like we wrote our book in two weeks, right? So I would write uh, the first part in the morning because that's when I work. And then she would actually read what I wrote and then write the second part of the chapter at night because that's when she worked. And so we, we literally just put out a book and, you know, like we had lots of work that we had done previously on our own. And so I know that that experience of what I just said is not necessarily normal. We, we just meshed really well on writing. So like when you're, how was that process of the two of you writing together and like what, like what advice, 
you know, people are listening. And it's like interesting watching your faces right now. So like I'm seeing, <laughs> right? I'm, all, I'm like all happy and she's like devastated. I gotta like, Aaron, I want you to, I want you to start here. Cause like, I'm, oh, is this like a, you. is this like, am I getting some dirt? Right. Is this like behind yeah. the scenes? This is like, let's Wait. see. I, this is like <laughs> drama, maybe some drama here. They, by the way, anyone who's, who's wondering why they told me use the soundboard lots. So like, I don't want anyone to get mad at me. They are like, sure. use that board. Right. So, so it's, Aaron, tell us about that process of writing. And I guess when you say with someone else, it's, you know, obviously you're talking about writing with Ross. How was that? Like, tell us like what, and what advice would you give to people, you know, right. Writing. I know you said you're writing yeah, a book. I want on... to write with Ross. <laughs> <laughs> don't. No. So it's funny because our first book, it, I think the funny, the, the reason it's funny is because <laughs> we wrote the two books totally different. Right. So like the first book, like we each, we split up the chapters. We each wrote our set of chapters. And then like, essentially we camped out in Ross's apartment when he lived over mm -hmm. in Beth, um, Bethlehem and went through each chapter together, like word for word. And then this book kind of emerged differently. Mm -hmm. It started out as one thing right. and then went through several different iterations. So I don't know, Ross, if you want to say anything else about that part. Yeah, it started out as like a more visual book. Like, oh, like let's create a more visual quick start guide to mm -hmm. PPL. And then it just morphed into like, as we were writing, um, just saying there's more to say, there's more to say, there's more to say. This is the second book we've ever written on project-based learning. Right. Um, probably the last, I think. Right. And um, we might as well say everything we have to say. So it turned into an all-encompassing book. Mm -hmm. um, so, it, and I think at first we divided up the chapters. I think we did divide. So it's like deciding on an outline, like a table of contents, yeah. right? That That's probably the first step is like, what is your table of contents going to look like? Um, and then dividing it up accordingly, probably based on our strengths. Mm-hmm. Then, right, that based on strengths, and then mm -hmm. you do a draft, you know, and then you look over each other's work, and, and then you go from there. And I think, the, I think the hardest part probably is like, there's this idea, I forget to quote, it's like, if you can't explain something in simple terms, you don't know it well enough, like something right. like that, or simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Yeah. And it's like, taking something like project based learning, which is tremendously right. complex, and explaining it in a way where people are like, oh, like, right, that finally makes sense. And and that was really so if you look at it, like everything was done with such attention to detail where it's like, it might not be overly complex, but it's like done in such a way that hopefully people are reading it and saying like, you know, after all this time of trying to wrap my head around project based learning, because of this book, I'm finally able to do so. So that that was really where I think the majority of the work was spent was on that attention to detail. Yeah. And, that, and George, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, before we started, you were talking a little bit about like this concept of dissonance and like disagreement. Mm -hmm. And so while it's sort of a joke that Ross and I are very different people, mm -hmm. I think it honestly makes the book better. Right. So like I'm very human centered and he's very curriculum nerdy and like, mm -hmm. so then, <laughs> So like together we pushed on each other and that I think made the book better. So. Uh oh, Ross is going to be like, I can't believe she called me curriculum nerdy. They ask you how you are. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. <laughs> you just can't get into it because they would never understand. I'm just teasing. She, she just doesn't get it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that actually, um, it, it is a really, that's a real, there's a couple concepts here that are, I think are really, really important. And I think, that you have some of those, uh, like it's, it's like you're saying, like you know, kind of we talk about having diver diverse viewpoints in our schools and things like that. But if everyone agrees on everything, like what what improvement actually happens, right? And I think that for me, when I was an administrator, I actually one thing I was very distinct at when hiring like a system principal, uh, my first principalship was to hire someone who was not like me. I didn't need another George. I already had me, right? I needed someone who Ooh. thought different. I needed someone who so, not only saw things uh, that I didn't see and had different perspectives, but also I know this is a weird thing, but it was approached by different people that wouldn't necessarily approach me. Do you know what I mean? And and having that yeah. understanding, right? So um, that, that was really 
I think it's not only beneficial to the community as a whole, uh, but it was really beneficial to me to, to like, you know, and I think that's partly kind of finding some of your weak spots. Um, Ross, one thing that you said, and I think this is something that I really try to do uh, in my keynotes and when I talk is take complex ideas and make them simple. And what I've seen before is that someone takes simple ideas and make them complex in the spirit of I'm smarter than everyone, right? Like it's, I'm going to use words you don't understand. And it's like a way for my ego to be filled, but no one's going to do this. Right. And I remember actually sitting at a keynote years prior to when I started doing this. And I remember watching this gentleman who was brilliant, who did really great stuff. But when you walked out of there, you're like, that's not me. Like I, I can't do that. That's, that's not me because it was like, it, it, there is no like, jumping point right and i think that i think you know from the work that i've read not only uh you know from your prior book but from your blog i think you both do that really well is that you make it where like oh like that's i can do that you know what i mean i think and I, like is is that like is that something like if you take something like like i'm gonna get put you on the spot here like what's like a complex thing that you've made simple that, you know, someone listening to that teaches grade five, you know, can do right away, like, and connect this. And I know that you can't like, Hey, just do this one thing. And you, you're, you, you're project based, you know, project based certified. Right. But like, what's like a simple idea that, you know, people can do right away. Yeah. So, so the idea is like a lot of times we have this idea and, and you've, you've written about this before, like, mm-hmm traditional practices like yep. we vilify traditional practices as bad and i think i think um when we do that um we're not always respecting the work that came before us but we're right. painting things in terms of like black and white mm-hmm. so a lot of times we do that with more progressive practices either you're doing like project-based learning genius hour design mm-hmm. thinking or you're doing something else which, which isn't as good right? right um so it's this whole idea where a lot of times with inquiry-based learning and project-based learning and I know we started out this way. We would look at that and say, this is wonderful. Our kids need to be learning through investigation and exploration. And anybody who's doing direct instruction, like that's right. terrible, right? right? Like there's no place for that. And, and of course, like the answer lies somewhere in between because it's not about us trying to be progressive. It's about <laughs> the needs of our students, right? right? So this whole idea of how might you infuse direct instruction into project-based learning. Mm-hmm. So, so to boil that down into something that you could easily wrap your head around we uh, categorize direct instruction during project-based learning into three different categories, proactive, reactive, and learning detours. And proactive is like, you know, the majority of your kids are going to need this. Mm -hmm. So you're going to teach it ahead of time before the project itself or right before they're going to need it within the context of the project. Reactive is like, oh my gosh, like as I'm teaching this project, I have found that the majority of my students now need to learn this concept or skill or whatever Mm -hmm. it might be. So now Mm -hmm. I'm going to teach it, whether it's one-on-one, whether it's in small groups, or whether it's class-wide. And then learning detours is basically when students take their project in different directions based on maybe their passions or interests or any phenomenon that they might bump into during the project. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the space, I'm going to give space to my students so they could explore those passions and interests and phenomenon rather than saying to them, no, sorry, that's not what we're right, doing. Right. No time and place for that. So it, it's also like, I'll take it in the other direction. Like you said, sometimes we can make it complex. Mm-hmm. And one of the things I've learned is that like, there's a difference between making something simple and then also like simplifying it, right. which is like dumbing it down. Right. 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 So you could take it in both directions. So we're also making sure that as we're communicating something like this, somebody um, with deep knowledge of PBL, hopefully won't be like, well, that's not true. Or you're taking something that right. really is important and, and that, that that's not right. Or, or that, that's just, that doesn't work. Mm-hmm. So I think it could go in like both directions, but th- there's, there's an example right there that, um, that we often use and it's in the book as well. So when you, when you, okay. So when like someone listening to this and Aaron, I'll, I'll ask you this question, someone listening to this, uh, they, they hear project-based learning and they say, oh, this is like a fad right? Like this is like, this is like the cool thing now. Uh, this is going to be for whatever. And then we're either going to do something totally different or we're going to call it something else, but it's really kind of project-based learning, but like with a little tweak, 
you know, like, how is this not just like a thing that we're doing now? And how is this like something, you know, like everything I think evolves over time, right? Like I, you know, I think the way that we look at relationships with our students always been important, but the way that we connect with our students, especially people going in virtual spaces, how we connect online, those things evolve and we change them, but we, it's always the constant as relationships are important. So like, how do you see this as a constant, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now? How do, how do you look at that? Um, you know, with project based learning. Sure. So Ross is going to be super jealous because this is one of his favorite things to explain. Mm -hmm. So feel free to jump in if you think I'm not doing it justice. (laughs) But essentially like project based learning, it is a thing, right? Like we've now put a label on project based learning, but it's what it is, is a series of best practices that have been put together in a context, like in a, in context. Right. So it's the it's the concept of um, all like these these best practices. So providing direct instruction in small chunks within the context of your project. Right. Um, it is ensuring that there's collaboration. It is ensuring that kids are getting feedback. Um, so all of these things that should exist in mm-hmm. any class because we know that they're what are good what's good for kids. Um, are all part of project-based learning, and it's just how you put them together. Uh, so they do have staying power. And I would also right. point to the fact that project-based learning was actually a term that was coined in the late 70s. So mm-hmm. it's already been around for a while. Um, I don't think it's going to – I think it's past its fad phase. Right. Um, just what's best. Yeah, actually, I think I – think- I, I coined it when I was four. Now that I remember, Is that I remember, what it was? I, I remember doing Lego <laughs> stuff and saying to my mom, like, I'm like, I'm doing project based learning. And she's like, that's great. Yeah. And because, and I don't get the credit because the internet didn't exist at the time. So, right. It's just on that film. Right? <laughs> you have to hold yeah. it up to the light. Yeah. So yeah, that was, yeah, that was, uh, yeah. I remember very clearly when I was four talking about that. Um, <laughs> so Aaron, just, uh, you know, just, Hey, for full context, everybody, uh, just so you know, I was joking that actually didn't happen. I was five. So, so, uh, <laughs> I don't want, I don't want to get credit. As a, fact checking. Yeah. It was 1980, not 79. Okay. So right. just in case anyone's fact checking this. Um, so, so kind of building on that too, then the progression, and you said you have a very human centered approach, right? And I, that is something, uh, I know Ross knows that about me and the work that I do. And not that saying that Ross, you, if you're a curriculum person, you don't, you know, like people or anything like that. Right. So like, what's the, what, what's the, so one of the things that I hear, okay. And this is, um, and, and I'm curious about this because you use the term collaboration, right? Which we say is good practice. I really like doing stuff on my own too. And I need that space. And I think that we've, I think we've sometimes, uh, kind of, we always swing pendulums in education. Like, it's like, Hey, we need more, like school for me was collaboration. It was like, who can I destroy doing times tables on the board? Right. Cause I'm going to be the best at times tables. It wasn't like, let's work on math problems together. It was like, they put us on the board, last person standing, boom. I know nine times six better than anybody. That's it. Right. And it's like, Hey, maybe that's not like beneficial to some people. And then it's like, Hey, let's get rid of that. Totally and then go totally collaboration. I've seen that swing, right? And I think, hey, sometimes I benefit over working on my own. Sometimes I benefit from working with others. So like when you talk about that human-centered approach, like how, how, do, how does that, like how do you focus on like honoring individual students and individual needs? Like how, what does that look like? Because I know you said, Aaron, that's a big focus for you. Yeah, it starts with knowing them. Right. So, you know, I think that the, when, when we're consulting and we're working, whether I'm working with teachers in our, in my own district or with other districts, I always start by saying like, well, tell me about your kids. And right. if they can't tell me things about like, other than like what their paperwork says, right. um, then that's like a huge red flag. So you, they need, you need to start by knowing your kids. Do they, do we know which kids like to work by themselves and who doesn't like to work and who doesn't like to work by themselves? Cause some kids are the polar opposite. Like they want to be in the group for that safety. Um, so it's all about designing projects and just designing a learning experience around who the humans are that you have in front of you. So you have to get to know them first. And project-based learning actually gives you an avenue to do that. Um, so if you haven't already built in some of those structures to get to know your students, um, 
in a project as you're conferencing, you will get to know them because you need to be really deliberate about sitting down with mm -hmm. them and talking about the work that they're doing and what's driving that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that's, I think that for me is, um, really taking that time to honor is actually interesting. I just, when I, um, when I got off the, when I got off the, I, I got off a keynote that I was just doing right before I started talking to you. And it was actually the head of the parent council. And this is like 11 years ago when I was principal, she asked me to work with her group. Right. And so that was an honor because, you know, she still remembers me, but her daughter was in grade, I think two, and she's in her first year of college. And she's like, Hey, Alyssa wants to say hi to you. Right. I'm like, great. And of course, like I'm expecting grade two, Alyssa, but it's like first year college, Alyssa shows up. And I was like, Hey, like, are you still, you know, doing BMX biking and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, how do you know? Like, how do you remember that? I'm like, cause I like, like those things I like, I wanted to know, right? Like that's me knowing that about you actually. And you know, I wasn't her teacher. I was the principal. Right. And I think that was maybe even a little bit more shocking. Uh, and then I asked her to introduce me and she's like, no, I said, well, I obviously wasn't good enough then. So <laughs> She doesn't remember. So, yeah, she's that you like, were a Who BMX is this guy? Biker. Yeah, so I was, I was a little bit upset about that. No, no, it was, uh, it, 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 you know. <laughs> so whatever. No, it, you it only was good. Told that story so you could push that. I'm up. like, yeah. So that's what I actually do. I like it's backwards design. So I actually <laughs> look at the sound, and then I no that I, th that actually is true. And I, it, I like I made a joke, but it, it was it was it was really nice because. Um, it was nice seeing her and seeing that and then her actually appreciating that I remembered things about her. Right. And I mm -hmm. think that to me says a lot, whereas I don't, I, I, I feel like some of the teachers that I had wouldn't recognize me, but I had a, I talked about my grade three or my kindergarten teacher on a, on a podcast she commented on YouTube and like talked about specific things I did in kindergarten. Like f this is for 40 years ago. W like I know I invented project based learning that year, but <laughs> in kindergarten class. Yeah. And I know that was like a big achievement, but <laughs> no, but that like, it was like, I, I was just so in awe. Like I was so in awe and that really meant, and I think really knowing your students is, is really important. And, and so Ross, I'm going to ask you because, um, a lot of people are going, um, and I think your school district, uh, cause I know you're in New York state probably was virtual for the majority of the year. Correct. Yeah. And uh, so last, last March, April, May, last year, last couple months of the school year. Oh, but okay. But not, yeah. And so not in the 2020, 21 school year not at the elementary level. Okay. It's an option. We, we are coming into school every day. Okay. Um, yeah, but uh, students have the option. But last year, last March, April, May, June. So, so like, so I got to ask you because you've had this and you've had this experience, and there's going to be people listening to this. Like, hey, like it's really hard to get my kids even show up, right? Like, I can't even get my kids to these Zoom spaces. I know, like, by the time, like, honestly, by the time you're listening to this, you could actually be face to face or back to virtual, depending on what's going on where you live right now, right? Like. Literally, I live in a place that just locked down again, and we're recording this in April. So I know people are like struggling with this and like how, like people are going to look at this, maybe especially with all the complexities of the year. And um, I don't, I don't want to say this, well, it kind of is in a negative way. Like some of the things that we've done face to face this year, and I understand why, because of the health concerns. It's like all the things that we're trying to do, getting kids, like having conversations, connecting with one another. It's like, no, you got to like, we're going to bubble you away from each other and almost promote like simply direct instruction. And, and all of us have made it clear. We're not against direct instruction. Um, just, just like with some of the complexities of the year, right? Some of the complexities of this year and some of the teachers feeling like this is going to be like, I'm just trying to get through this, right? Like I'm just trying to like get through this year and, and understandably so. Like, how do you, like, is this something they can do and how do you do it, especially in different environments? Like they could be face to face, virtual or hybrid or something that's all three in the week. Yeah. I, I mean, it's which I think is just hybrid, but yeah, I mean, it's like, <laughs> it's like you have some teachers Yikes. that are teaching across two classrooms with, you know, with like right. partners or plus students True. who are on 
Zoom or Google Hangouts or whatever. I mean, it's tough, right? It's tough. And, you know, anything we talk about regarding this type of teaching and learning is not easy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, is mm -hmm. that we could spend all day talking about the, the complexities and how tough it is on just everybody from a physical and emotional standpoint and all that stuff. Um, so I, I think it's like, it starts with what you said, this idea that we're not, this idea that like, okay, like, yes, to an extent, we're just trying to get through this. Mm -hmm. And yes, to an extent, there might be a little bit more direct instruction than normal, mm -hmm. but it's also a good excuse to try new things, right? Because it's like, um, what do they call it? Like low floor, high ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. So my, it's a good chance, you know, good, good opportunity, good chances to try some new things. And I think a lot of it, um, and I was actually talking to a teacher about this today, is just is like bringing predictability to what, like almost like a routine to these mm -hmm. projects in a way. So because a lot of students, especially at the elementary level, you don't want this whole thing where like they're on camera the whole time. Like imagine if they like sometimes mm -hmm. we do things to students that we wouldn't want done to ourselves. And it's like imagine if someone were to say, "Go work for an hour, but keep your camera on so I could keep an eye on you." Right? <laughs> like, like it's like kind of like stalkerish. Like, like right. so like we like we shouldn't do that to students, and and we mm -hmm. want to create the optimal conditions under which both adults and students could work. So I think it's I think it's this like push and pull between like providing a predictable structure, but still giving students some flexibility regarding um, what their process and what their product might look like. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you could look at it, we look at it in terms of tracks, like it could be a product track where students create a product or contribute to an event or through the lens of like a problem track where you're solving a problem that's either like an, a made up problem or a real world problem, a problem students find on their own or a teacher or a problem that the teachers give to a student. Mm -hmm. So that's a way of kind of compartmentalizing the different ways you could attack project based learning. And then through that, you have different components. Uh, you have the title of the project. You might have um, the standards that you're going to hit, um, what you want students to understand as a result of the project, an essential question or we call an, an umbrella question. So kind of like building this routine into the project. So no matter what you're focusing on, there's like these consistent layers, but mm -hmm. the content might stay the same, uh, the content changes. And also regarding how the students tackle the pro project uh, might change as well. I think something that's really unique, and this carries over to doing this um, in a classroom setting, is having some type of digital hub set up. Mm -hmm. Like you really want, like I always ask, like, how might we design the conditions for students to move forward with their work in our absence, right? And I think, and once again, I was talking with a teacher about this today, when you're delivering this type of instruction or any type of instruction um, in a virtual environment, you almost have to like over scaffold, mm -hmm. because if you're in the same physical space as the students, you could walk around, you could visit them at their tables, you could visit them at their desks, and essentially you could meet them where they are and move them in the right direction. It's a lot harder to do that in a digital environment, whether it's Zoom, Google Hangouts, or whatever it might be. So having some type of digital hub set up, whether it's Seesaw, or Google Classroom, mm -hmm. um, Canvas, whatever, where you have like all these resources, whether right. um, the resources that are specific to the project, whether it's research uh, resources, um, whether it's something that you're going to use from one project to the next like resources on like presentations, collaboration, whatever it might be. And you have it set up in an intuitive way. So if the students are having issues, rather than having to bother you, the teacher, um, they can access the content and move forward in your absence. So really it's about creating those routines within the project itself, but also a solid digital environment. Mm -hmm. um, so students can move forward without you there and, and hopefully with their cameras turned off as well. The, well but take risks. Like, why not? Like I said, low, low, uh, low floor, high ceiling. Well, I, I, I think part of it too, is that when you're talking about the idea of risks, I think it's, can we kind of rethink how we see learning? Right. So one of the, like, there's this whole, and I've seen it about like cameras on, I'm like, do we really need cameras on? And then being totally honest, I see a lot of adults, they go into staff meetings, they turn the camera off. Right. It's like, we don't know the kids are doing this and stuff like that. And I think there has to be, and I understand that they're children and I, and I get that, but what you're talking about is, you know, if their cameras are off, but they're creating a product, then that's pretty good evidence of learning. Right. Mm -hmm. But you actually, me having my camera on and I I've, I've had this conversation with educators over and over again. And like, if I'm in a class and it's like, we do this eyes up here, right? 
That doesn't mean I'm learning. All it means is I'm looking at you. I can stare at people and not listen to anything they say. And I can do that very, very well, right? Like I'm, mm-hmm. and it doesn't actually mean I'm learning and there's no evidence of that. It's like, yeah. that makes me feel good. But, but what, what did you get out of it too, right? And I think there's different ways to actually do this. And actually like one of the things that we have to also kind of identify is that um, like a lot of, I've seen people say like, Hey, eye contact is like, that tells me that you're listening. Well, actually in some cultures, like eye contact is a sign of disrespect. And so like that, that is actually something that has to be kind of thought of. So you're, you're showing this opportunity for learning. And when I say like rethinking, I, this is going to be a little bit embarrassing, but, um, I I've been in some sessions where I'm like about to leave, but they do the first hour and I'm just kind of like listening, seeing what's going on and understanding that. And what I'll do is I'll turn my camera off and I'll get on my, I'll start playing guitar and I'll, and I like, I, I need to fidget. I need to move around. And I'm not like, you know, trying to be Bob Dylan and, you know, singing out loud and, and ignoring, I'm just like strumming. I'm just like moving mm-hmm. my hands. And I would never let that would never be allowed in a classroom or not, at least when I was a kid. And I under like, I, I'm not even saying it should be because I can understand how that'd be distracting, um, to other students. But in this space, it actually like kind of calms me down, helps me to listen. And yeah, it might not work for all kids, but it really helps me. And then I'm very aware of what's going on, but it's that manipulation of this. But if I actually turn my camera on and you saw me strumming guitar, you probably wouldn't listen to the teacher. You'd probably watch what I'm doing. And, and I actually, I, there was a session I did and at the beginning they said, Hey, we want the, we want you all to keep your cameras on, right? We want you all to keep your cameras on. So we know you're engaged. I'm like, ah, I don't want that. Like, why are you saying that? Right. And so a superintendent, I'll never forget this superintendent for an hour on the treadmill had his computer. And so I, for an hour had to look at him chugging his arms. And it was just like, I don't want to see this. I don't, I don't need this. Like, like I'm so happy for you. You're moving and that's great. I can't imagine having to sit down all day. And if, if that's the way you learn, but I don't want to watch you. Like, I don't want to see this. Right. And I think it's, it's not only kind of taking risks, but I think it's like saying like, Hey, like maybe we need to kind of, how do we know someone's learning? Just that their presence doesn't mean they're learning. Right. And I, Aaron, I saw that you kind of like when I, I said about the eye contact thing, Right. I saw you kind of agree with me. And so I don't know if you have more thoughts on that, because I think like you, you, you both of you are making really good arguments about like, how do we know actually someone's learned? Right. And it's not yeah. just presence. I think that what you're kind of poking at is this, our reliance on compliance. Mm-hmm. Right. So like we, um, I think earlier, I can't even remember if it was on the call or not, but we were talking about like, how do we measure success? Right. And to some, for some educators in certain, like in some places, success is I got through the day and I didn't have to write anybody up. So all my kids learned today, right? Like I had an uninterrupted learning day, but is that really what learning looks like? Does Mm -hmm. that really prove that kids learned something that day? Or is it more about their product? Like what did kids create today? Could kids tell me what they learned today? Like, cause that's your ultimate barometer. Yeah. Like what did they walk away with? What would the kids say they learned versus what the teacher says they taught? Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we rely on the fact that like the kids sat in a seat and wrote down and nobody interrupted me. Mm-hmm. It was a good mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. I, I think also like if a, a couple things, like if a student's like not getting their work done because their camera's off, I should be asking myself, like, what could I do differently? Mm-hmm. Like, how is this learning relevant to my learners, if at all? Or how is there some account? And I hate the word accountability, but to an extent, there is some accountability. Mm-hmm. How is there some accountability built in? I think the other thing, George, you wrote a great blog post a while back that I'll, I remember is like the idea of like, um, like you could tell a lot about a district by like the red tape you have to go through right. or don't have to go through in order to totally. work there. And I think it's like about alignment. It's like sometimes we're in one, we have like, what is it? Like one foot in one door and one in the other. Like, it's kind of like, we want to be this like innovative district, but we want to bring George in. And in order to bring him in, he has to do like all this paperwork. Right. right? And it's right. like, and it's so, so in the same vein, it's like, how could you say you believe in risk-taking innovation, pro, you know, so these like. project-based learning experiences, but you have to keep your camera on because we want compliance. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like it just, yep. it, 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 it like, it's like pick one, it's like pick one and make sure that there's an alignment, not just at the classroom level with the students, 
but with the teacher, with your administrators, um, that, 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 that belief system should permeate every aspect of your organization. Like if you're crying out for like student choice and uh, student voice and choice, um, your administrators should have it as well. Your teachers should have it as well. Every, like, like, like if that's really your belief system, mm-hmm. like stick with it and go with it. Don't like fluctuate based on whatever is good for you, given the current situation. Yeah, the, the, that's a, a really good point. And I have talked a lot about this and I think it is because it's, it's like we ask teachers to try different things, but then for them to do that, they have to jump all these obstacles. And like, th- this is the, this is the most, the least innovative example, but it, it was, it's, I always try to, cause I think it makes sense on this. Right. So I, I'm not saying this is like a transformational practice. Right. But we had, we had, um, we had portable smart boards, right? I don't know if you might call them something different, whatever, but you know, the interactive whiteboards, right? So a lot of schools years ago, what they did, they didn't give every teacher a smart board. They bought two and they were portable. And what they were going to do is that everyone is going to use them equally, right? So you're just, we have a little checkout list and a sign up sheet and all this other stuff, right? So, you know, when it's my turn, I'm going to like wheel the smart board down to my session and whatever, right? But then I'm like doing something and some kid walks by and bumps it. I'm like, oh, I got to like recalibrate this. Right. And then I have to recalibrate it 84 times. I love that. The recalibration. Yeah. Do you remember that? And you just like have to do I this like little thing, clear. right? Yeah. You have to like, uh, and you're like, ah, oh, right. And really what I saw over and over again is like basically in every school, only three teachers were willing to do that 84 times a day. Right. And what happened was those three teachers then kept the smart board all day in their classroom, right? Cause they were willing to jump the hoop. They were willing to go through that. So if you wanted that to be a practice that you utilize, and again, please don't like, Oh, this is what George says innovation. No, I'm just, this is, there's a bigger picture here is that if you want people to use them, you put them on the wall and you don't have to calibrate them cause you can't bump them. Right. And then that's it. And so the, the thing is, is that you want to make it so easy that people don't have to jump hoops to do it. Cause it's not only, it's not only beneficial to the person who doesn't want to jump hoops. It's also beneficial to the person who will, right? Cause now you've removed that barrier and they can, they can do things as well. And so as a district, like when I worked at central office, a question that I always ask is like, how are we lessening what our teachers have to do so they can teach? Not how are we giving more to actually justify our jobs? Like, Hey, I'm this person. Can you fill out this survey so you can justify what I've done? I know you're super busy, but can you do this survey? Like January is like every department sends out surveys to their teachers. And it's like, are you kidding me? Right. And Hey, we're going to bring pizza to you because we know if you eat some, you're going to be way nicer on the survey. It's going to make us look really good. And so it's like, I think that you made a really good point. Ross is that that idea of like, we want people to try stuff. We want people to take risks, but I want to use a website and I have to fill out 84 forms to my, you know, to like unblock it because, uh, I can be with children all day, but I can't go on Google Chrome on my own without assistance. Like, are you kidding me? It's, it's ridiculous. Right. And so I think, I think that, that to me, like for administrators out there, uh, I always say this, like, Hey, if your teachers aren't embracing things, don't blame them. What are you doing? Like change something you're doing, right? That's, that's literally your job is to get them to try that. So don't just say like, oh, try harder. It's like, no, you're doing something wrong. You're doing something that could be different. Think about that process. Yeah, 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 I I agree. (laughs) It's like, it's like, it's, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, and I think it exists, you know, something that that is a problem, you know, it it can be a problem. It's like, like I said, it's like, stick with what you believe in and go with it. You know, you can't say, you can't say like, um, like, oh, like we want to innovate and then say fidelity. And I hate the, like, I hate the word fidelity. Like, like, you know, basically fidelity says, um, like, we don't trust you, you know? Right. And uh, I think there's a time and place for it, but I think it's used way too much. Um, it's like, you know, taking a direction and, and going with it. That's probably, you probably think it's used too much because Aaron has like influenced you so much with the human centered approach. Right. That's right. That's right. People I, I are not to, widgets. I, I used, people are not widgets. I used, I used to love it. And now I, and now I don't like it. The other thing I'll say too, is like, you're talking about like justifying your jobs, mm-hmm. I think something else, um, going down that path, like something we also have to be careful about is especially like in bigger districts, um, is when you have like a lot of cooks in the kitchen, mm-hmm. um, like in all these like different titles and, you know, like all these different, I don't know, like directors and supervisors right. and superintendents, like 
they all feel like, and this is a generalization, but this happens, like they all feel like they have to justify their job um, in some way, shape or form, or they always have to do something, right? We always right. have to do something. And one, when you always have to do something um, in some way, shape or form, when you don't have relationships and when you don't do it with tact, um, when you're constantly talking about what could be, mm -hmm. you're also subtly sometimes taking a jab at what is. Right. So we have to make sure we do that um, in a careful way and approach that with tact. But also when everybody has to get their stuff in, you know what I mean? Like everybody has to get their stuff right. in. Like who does it fall on? It falls on building level administration yep. and it falls on the teachers totally. and then it falls on the students. And then we have like fragmentation, right? Like we have fragmentation, we have initiative overload and, and we typically move backwards instead of forwards. So I think it's having this, like, it's basically systems thinking, like looking at everything as a whole mm -hmm. um, and deciding on like how much, like what your capacity is. And basically that's collaboration. It's systems thinking, but also um, being in touch with what's really going on and what's not going on at the building level. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that, you know, I thought of when you were talking about. So like, like systems level everything. thinking with fidelity. All that, all that, oh, but but we're playing buzzword bingo here. No, but when you talk about it, when, when, when you mentioned isn't that, pizza, isn't that, isn't your, your old blog title was uh, Fidelity with Koopa Loop? Fidelity with Koopa Loop. <laughs> no, but when, when you talked about pizza, I got excited, but also when you talked about everybody having to justify their job. Right. Um, you know, that, that, that's yep. something that happens. That is something that but happens. This is, this is one of the huge fallacies, right? Like, oh, I want to work myself out a job. No, if you're really that good, you'll, they'll always find you a job. No one's going to be like, hey, you did such an amazing job. We don't need you anymore. See ya. And if they're saying that, it's because they didn't want you. And so like the reality of it is, is that if you do so well that you build a culture or people are doing stuff on their own, people always find a place for you. People always find, you know, it's, that's like a total lie. I, I, it's, you know, and of course we want to work to that position. But like I said, there will always be a position uh, for you. So I want to... Uh, just for the sake of time here, because I know uh, I'm keeping you probably longer uh, than you have time, and uh, I want to I want to honor this. And Aaron actually said that we could try to keep her here for the last two months, so that she could be. This would be like a live streaming of her getting her doctorate, right? So it's yeah, like a yeah. marathon. So I don't want to I don't keep you with that. But Aaron, I'm going to ask you about I'm this. Um, so project based learning, right? Project, like, why didn't you put, like, ha what's the hashtag for it on Twitter and social media? Is it hashtag Project Based Learning? Real PBL. Real PBL. Uh, I've been using fake PBL the whole time. Oh, darn it. <laughs> what, what? Oh, you uh, got for that. Wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, PBL. I was like, what's, like, what? That was peanut butter and what? And the, I don't know. I'm Greek, so I thought peanut butter and lamb. <laughs> So first thing that, I thought, that, I apologize. That actually works if it's a nice braised lamb. <laughs> there you go. Oh, God. So, so Aaron, here we go. Project based learning. Okay. Give us the, like the, you know what? I hate this question being asked of me. So I'm going to ask it of you. Great. <laughs> Give us the elevator pitch. Tell us about in one yes. minute, this book, project based learning. Sure. Okay. So basically that book is a compilation of questions that we have been asked over the last few years. Oh, about project-based learning and we honestly where the word real came from is that they were our honest answers so here's how we messed this up in the first place Ooh, that's and good. how we tried to fix it i love that that's all i you know actually my so not to i'm not trying to bring this back to me but that's just why i love it but you're gonna anyway yeah i am <laughs> So my, my keynotes are all my arguments I've had with other people in keynote form, yeah. right? So it's like, hey, this is an argument. And I don't say like, here is an argument I had with this person on Tuesday. But I, I, I just, I love that concept because I think a lot of times it's, it's kind of your, your, and you actually, one of the parts that you talk about to start with the end in mind is that it's kind of addressing the, the issue before it's even asked a little bit too, right? The yes, buts. It's yeah. all the yes, but awesome. what about this? Yeah. Okay, Ross, yeah. your turn. Let's see. Let's see what you got for the one minute. I'll just. Uh, I don't. Because Aaron's is really good. I'm already. I'm still thinking about lamb and peanut butter. I think. Um, <laughs> yes, right. And gyros. I think. Um. I think no, but every chapter is. There's like uh, nine chapters. Yeah. The first chapter or the um, 
the introduction is why project based learning and it yep. ends with how how can I get started. So nine chapter eight chapters plus the introduction makes nine full chapters. Um, you know, and each one is, you know, a question. It's um, how do I structure a PBL experience? How do I grade project based mm -hmm. learning? How do I integrate direct instruction? And it's basically, I think it lends itself to book studies. It lends it. It's usable. <laughs> like it, it's, I think it's very usable. Yeah. And I think I think also what makes it unique is we start off in the first chapter by basically rather than giving you the structure of project based learning mm -hmm. throughout, we give it to you at the beginning in the most simple form without simplifying it without dumbing it down but in the most simple form right. and then the rest of the book we answer all the questions that pop up so basically at the beginning we're giving you the forest from the trees if that makes sense like we're giving you the bigger picture and then it's saying okay now let's zero in on the questions that might come up while you're looking at project-based learning as a whole um so we think it's very practical. We also think a lot of the story, George, you told me a while back, I always remember our conversations. They hold a near and dear place to my heart. You said the only, you said the only- Why'd you laugh like that, Aaron? You, you said- um, Why'd you, you said, laugh? Yeah. One, one time you, you like, you got mad at me. You said, you don't listen when I talk. So this shows that I listen. Yeah. I, um, I, you said something like the only person you throw under the bus on social media is yourself. I yeah. thought that was, but I think that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the stories in there, rather than it's very, I think Aaron says, like, since Aaron's a human one, it's very right. human. And what basically, instead of like talking about, like throwing people under the bus, um, like we throw ourselves under the bus. And rather than like a lot right. of times we, it's easy to write a book and show up at a presentation and be like, I've done the work, I've done the research, this is how to do it. Right. And you read a lot of the stories that are in there. Um, it's about the mistakes that we've made so rather than saying we're the expert, you're the novice, it's painting all of us um, as learners, as learners who just want to do better by our students. And and also people are, it shows empathy. So the people who are reading it, who are going through struggles, they don't think those struggles are exclusive to them. It's like, hey, even these people who are considered PBL experts, they went through what I'm going through right now. So that's okay. I just need to keep moving forward. Uh, so it's, it's like this balance of research, practicality, but also... Uh, stories, mm -hmm. um, stories, because a lot of people you don't buy in the research. Like a lot, a lot of times it's like when you start a present, you know how it is. Like yep. you start, we, stories are what move us, right? Totally. Like with, nobody said, oh, I need to do that initiative because Robert Marzano said so, right? Like, <laughs> right, like, right. like it's not like there's a time and place for research, but it's, yeah. you know, it's the heart first, right? And then the head, right? So that, Aaron, I don't know what, what did you do to this guy? Yeah. This is like, I, this, is Ro this is Ross, this is Ross 2.0. I like this Ross 2.0. I, 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 um, I watched, I watched the notebook a couple of times and, and <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't me. It was Nicholas Sparks. It was Nicholas Sparks. Please but tag him when you post it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what, that's what quarantine will do to someone, right? It's like, like I, 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 I ran out of movies. It's time yeah. for the notebook. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think, I think, um, yeah. do you know, yeah, just I, so you know, the, the yeah. notebook Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The main stars, both Canadian. Just I was going to say it. I knew both that was Canadian. coming. I knew it. I was yeah. like, I'm okay. pretty sure he's okay. Canadian. So two things. Okay. Two things. For, well, actually three things. First of all, I love that. I love that you're pointing out the problems, right? And not from someone like that teacher did that. And this is how I fixed them. Right. Cause I, I don't like doing that. And I just, I feel you know, um, like I'm sure I've done that in the past and I, I don't want to, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, I said three things. There's, I know what the, I know what one of them is, but I can't remember the second one. Okay. So maybe it's just, maybe it's just two things. I am getting emotional. Okay. So I'm going to, can I ask you, I'm putting you on the spot here and, uh, Oh, Oh, I remember the second thing. I, I want to just say thank you for remembering some stuff that we talked about. Cause I actually don't even remember meeting you in person. So that. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> Just kidding. But, but I brought you dinner and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was, yeah. With, uh, yeah. I remember I, Tony told me you were there. I didn't, I didn't actually talk to you. <laughs> okay. No. Okay. So I'm going to put you both on the spot. Okay. And this is like, so I'm like, this is going to cost you money. Okay. Are you willing to each give a signed copy to someone listening to this podcast? Can you do that? Yes. You know, okay. Yeah. Okay. And this was not planned, but here's the trick. You have to comment on YouTube and Aaron, I'm going to ask you, you have to write the secret word 
and that's the only way you can win. So we are like, I, I don't know, we're like 40 min minutes into this. So if someone made it this far, they deserve, you know, and it's like, we're talking two books, one from Ross, one from Aaron. What it, Aaron, what's the secret word? They have to write it in the comments on YouTube. So you could be listening to this on Spotify. You could be listening to this on iTunes. So Aaron, what? What is the secret word? They have to write something else, but they have to use the secret word in the sentence. Human. I'll take it. Okay. So if you do that and I'll hint at it in the intro of this, because uh, I know I, like, as I talk to you more and more uh, about this and I, I just love the approach. This is the one question I want to ask you before we end. I'm going to ask you a more, sorry, sorry. You probably, I'm sorry. Okay. Everyone see you later. It's over. Aaron's got to go. No. <laughs> Okay, so so I'm looking at this, right? Oh, and I saw Tom Murray wrote the forward. <laughs> Do you know him? Did Tom Murray write the forward? How come yeah. you didn't ask me? Huh? <laughs> Just kidding. You know, the, the, the book that, you know, the book didn't turn out perfectly. No, no. Yeah. We were happy to have Tom. Brady. Okay. So I was, I was going to ask, okay. So like, I'm looking at this, how do I include direct instruction? How do I build a PBL culture? So I can read this book, obviously front to back, but I want to just like, I want to, like, I just have the question about grades. Okay. And like, I want to just get to that right away. Can I read the chapter standalone? The two? Yeah, you can. It's, it's so like at the end of the introduction, it says like how to use this book. Mm -hmm. So we, we purposely made sure that by answering all the questions, we string together how to do PBL in its entirety. So it's not like it's not like an FAQ, a fragmented FAQ mm -hmm. where you're going to read it all and be like, that's great. You answered my questions, but I still don't know how to do PBL. Mm -hmm. um, so all the answers strung together front to back detail PBL in its entirety. You could and you could dive into you could dive into any chapter and just get that question answered. There might be some like academic type vocabulary okay. that you might have to refer, you know, that you might have to get like, right. that you might have to have defined earlier on in the book. But for the most part, aside from the, that, yes, you should be able Good. to do that. Okay. So for anyone listening, say the secret word human in the comments on YouTube. It's gotta be on YouTube. Project based learning. You gotta use the word human. Okay. So last thing, Aaron, what was your favorite thing about working with Ross? My favorite. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Um, oh man. So the, do you honestly, want me to, I can like, I can, oh, yeah. can I like, do you want me to, do you want me to, I can I pretend that we lost you. If that helps, I can pretend no, like, oh, so where did it? Oh, Aaron's not. Wifi went out. I'm gone. She got, no, I actually, I have a good one. Okay. He get buys the best food. So like when we are <laughs> together, I am always well fed. Oh boy. Okay. So All right. that's the best thing. About working we wrote the Ross. first book together in Pennsylvania. I would do food trips. I would run out and get us like food and then come back with food. But this time I wasn't able to do that. Yeah. <laughs> that's, okay. All right. So, uh, Ross, <laughs> this is, I like that. that was a good answer. Okay. Ross, that's what you got to follow up. Ross brings good food. <laughs> What he's got. Okay. That's, what was like Ross? What was, it, what was your favorite thing about working with Aaron? Oh, yeah. this will be good. I love this. Uh, yeah. I'm going to have I, more I, of these types. Okay, let's Aaron, do it. Aaron, Aaron did a really good job on the graphics. I think. <laughs> he, um, he did, he did, he did that's good. Important. food, but the graphics, um, she, um, yeah, the, um, the, so every chapter, has a, a graphic that's called PBL paralysis. Yeah. That's basically, that's a, uh, a phrase that we, we coined and basically like why, like, as if like you're paralyzed and you don't want to move forward with project-based learning. So it's basically like almost like a quick fix for like a common like question or problem, um, that relates to PBL, like a smaller question or mm -hmm. problem than the entire chapter in and of itself, but like something that like people might want to know about, like, like time management. Um, what's another one? Like, having students like teaching students how to collaborate, like something like that. Mm -hmm. Aaron did can can I just, can, Aaron, do you want to revise your answer? Or... <laughs> Yours is like, like food. Yeah. Food, food. and it, Ross it, brought, it, and Ross brought good food. Yeah. I, I, I'm I, sticking I, with it. All right. Okay. okay. <laughs> okay. Graphics, were great. Graphics were great. I think <laughs> it turned out great. 
they're good. Yeah, and and just just so you know, we're all we're all just joking around because they, they I'm just trying to find this podcast is all about how can I use my soundboard. <laughs> he just wanted reasons. I just wanted it. I just wanted that. No, it, I I know um I know that people will really benefit from all of the the work that you've done, and it, what, like what I really appreciate is that um you're like I'm a big advocate of the notion that educators are researchers. I don't like that it's like researchers and educators. I hate that because it's like you talk to kids, you do practices every day. It's not like you try something, you're like just give up on it. I'm sure you were fine, do different things, see how it works, but you know your kids, right? And I think that the way you, you kind of put it together. So um, for anyone listening, we got a, we got a competition. You got two signed books coming, one from, uh, from Aaron and one from Ross, the excellent bringer of food. So just use the word, just word human. And R- Ross, you are, it is fair. You are pretty, you are pretty into food. Like you're a big, you're a big foodie. I I am into food. So I, I guess that I guess that you know that's pretty. That's pretty. See, I gave him a human compliment. I was my compliment was about him as a person, not just as an author. He's already got the best selling author title. He doesn't need me to tell that's him right. that. Okay, Aaron, well, Aaron, you're a good person too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you. Sorry, Rock. They ask you how you are. You just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine. You just can't get into it because they would. Run. That's that's gonna be Ross later. I, that, that sums up the pandemic. They ask you how you're doing. And totally. I don't know what that's from, but like you say, you're it's Kardashians. Really you don't you don't, you just watch Notebook, but you don't watch the Kardashians. No, that wasn't the card. Isn't that Taylor Swift? Maybe I don't know. I don't know what's from either. I just assume it's from the Kardashians. All right. It was awesome. Anyone who's listening, check out Project Based Learning. You can win a copy. You just have to put the word human. And it's not everyone who puts it. Okay. Just so you know, it's only, there's only two copies, but you're the, if you comment, you're more likely to get it. So thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for being on the podcast. It was, it was awesome to just sit down and connect with you, Aaron, Ross. It's, uh, it's, it was great meeting you for the first time. And so... <laughs> No, it was, it, was, it was good to see you again. So I appreciate it, my friend. So thanks everyone for listening. Everyone have a wonderful day. Take care.